Guys, today uh, it's with Karen Strawn. She is the chief spokesperson for Men's and uh, Rights uh, Edmonton, specifically. But she's actually fairly well known and one of the top spokespeople in general for men's and human rights movements. Uh, she has a blog called Owning Your Shit, uh, which is a title I enjoy. She has a YouTube channel called uh, Girl Writes What, and uh, she co-hosts a weekly show called Honey Badger Radio. Now, a lot of the people in the audience have asked us to talk to men's rights advocates. That is exactly what we're doing here. Now, uh, sometimes uh, on the show we have disagreed with such advocates on a case-by-case -case basis. That doesn't mean this is going to be a debate. Uh, this is going to be an informational expedition. Okay, Karen, thanks for joining us on The Young Turks. We appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. What exactly is men's rights? What does that mean? Um, there are certain issues uh, where men's rights are sort of routinely violated, at least on uh, as far as an equality basis. Um, there, there are certain situations uh, men can find themselves in where they uh, have essentially no due process, uh, particularly domestic violence and sexual assault cases uh, where you can be put in jail without any kind of, of due process at all, or you can be kept from your home. Um, and those those types of things, while well, the laws tend to be gender neutral, they do disproportionately affect men. Um, there's also, uh, there are some legal rights that men, uh, men lack. Uh, the right to genital integrity is one of the big ones, and it's sort of a, it's a bone of contention among some in this movement because there are some people uh, who believe that circumcision should be banned, and then there are others who don't feel that way. But it is uh, a very common complaint uh, in the movement that uh, circumcision is still legal and socially acceptable while female genital mutilation is protected. Uh, it's Well, it's banned uh, under uh, federal law in pretty much every Western country. Um, there are father's rights issues uh, that uh, need addressing. There is a very large sentencing gap uh, under the under the same conditions, uh, in the same circumstances, committing the same crimes. Uh, men are twice as likely to be incarcerated, and they are uh, they serve generally sixty to sixty five percent longer sentences. That's a wider gap than between uh, blacks and whites in the U.S. So, I mean, we, there are there are a whole host of issues uh, that uh, that deal with legal and uh, legislative problems and and stuff like that. Yeah. Then yeah. then there are social issues uh, that need to be addressed, social issues of sexism and stuff like that. So you know, as as you explain that uh, whole uh, penumbra of issues that that men's rights deals with, uh, it, it seems to me, as I suspected, that there are some things that. Uh, Clearly, need addressing, and some things that people are probably unaware of. You know, the sentencing points that you made are really interesting, and I'd like to know more about that, and I'll look into that more. Uh, and you know, parent parental rights for men. Uh, you know, issues about how assets are split during a divorce. Those are all super interesting. I mean, there's a story in the news uh, today about how Ken Griffin, who's a billionaire out of Chicago, is getting divorced, and is wife is uh, demanding a million dollars a month yeah uh, for because her three children have uh, grown accustomed to the lifestyle of having not one but two private jets uh, at their yeah. disposal yeah so. no and it's not just a million dollars it's a million dollars plus extraordinary expenses like fueling the jets and travel <laughs> expenses and stuff like that right and, they they and, all they all sound like extraordinary expenses to me well so. but you look at you look at it too when when women occasionally very wealthy women get dinged with having to pay that kind of alimony um there's a huge outcry and there's there's all kinds of like how dare you treat a woman the way we've been treating men all along right um that that's unfair right it's suddenly unfair when it's the other way around and uh i'm i'm hoping that as more women end up having to pay alimony that'll be provide the impetus the political will to do away with it at least in terms of uh of indefinite or lifetime alimony in states like florida so right so i think that there's a lot that we can agree on on issues like that uh, on the other mm -hmm. hand uh, i'm not sure that um I agree on some of the other things that you mentioned, but that's why we want to talk this through and see see where there we stand go. on things. Okay, so when you say um, 
let's, let's just take uh, the right to general integrity first. Uh, I'm uh -huh. amused by that uh, language. But um, so do you, do you uh, it's a wrong way of saying it, do you understand? Uh, do you agree uh, uh -huh. that female genital mutilation and, and circumcision are not the same thing? That that there is a legitimate reason to do a, a male circumcision, which is health. Now, you might disagree on that. I think a lot of people strongly disagree on whether there are good health reasons or not, but that that's the main reason to do it. Whereas female genital mutilation, there is absolutely, positively no health uh, consequence other than dire ones and, well, and no benefits whatsoever. And it's done simply for you know the honor of old customs and the pleasure of men, theoretically, etc. Like that, there's a big difference there. Um, there are differences for sure. Uh, some forms of FGM are actually uh, less severe than the typical circumcision, less damaging, uh, less permanent, um, and and others, of course, are are much worse. Um, but uh, one one of the uh, the issues around that is that you can actually find studies that have been done in in places like Yemen and stuff like that where FGM is still uh, performed, practiced, um, that show the exact same health benefits, uh, you know, a decrease in urinary tract infections and, you know, a decrease in sexually transmitted infections and stuff like that. Um, one of the things that most people don't know is that at least uh, sort of secular, in secular um, communities, um, in the U.S. in particular, a circumcision began uh, as a health issue but it began during the nervous excitation theory of disease before we learned about germs and stuff like that it was promoted by the guy who invented cornflakes dr uh, harvey john harvey kellogg i believe um and it was promoted as a way of preventing masturbation because masturbation was uh viewed back then to contribute to mental illness and epilepsy and spina bifida and spinal cord diseases and paralysis and all kinds of things like that and uh and you can find uh justifications you can find medical papers all through the history that um you know that circumcision cures mental illness circumcision cures epilepsy circumcision cures this it cures that it cures paralysis it you know mm -hmm. spinal paralysis it, it cures all of these things um so it, it really has been at least in the in the sort of the secular community or the the non-jewish non uh muslim communities it, it has been a cure searching for a disease the whole time Mm -hmm. And uh, and so there there really is uh, there's no um, there's no explicit or definite health benefit uh, okay. that you can that you can that you can provide as far as circumcising a minor child that that's really the thing I think that any right, any right. man yeah. should have the choice to do that but you know four month you know four day old babies don't have sex they're not going to get STIs. Um, the urinary tract uh, studies, uh, because most full-term babies were circumcised at the time, the uncircumcised ones were generally preemies in the study, and so of course they're going to be more susceptible to urinary tract infections and other health problems, all right? right? All right, um, Karen, these, Karen, these just, I, yeah. I, I don't want to spend too much time on that. I, like, there you go. I, I, I got it. I mean, I, I don't agree yeah. that uh, that it's that it has the same implications and that it's done for the same reasons. Uh, but I understand the, the things that you're laying out. People can decide whether, on their own whether they're in favor of circumcision or not. Uh, but if it was intended to uh, cure masturbation, I can assure the audience that it has not worked. Yeah, no, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. It really doesn't. Okay, no. all right. Uh, but I mean, all right, I don't want to go get back into it, but female genital mutilation is clearly to oppress women. Clearly, 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 clearly. Whereas circumcision it, 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 is not nearly as clear if it's even in that direction, which even if I granted that to you, it's certainly not like a, a worldwide thing, like let's oppress men by circumcising them. So, okay. Uh, it is, it, well, I mean, look at it this way. If, if it was, if it originated in order to, uh, to suppress male sexuality, um, then one might actually come to the conclusion that it, that it is there to 
yeah. uh, control, control the behavior okay. of men. I mean, the last thing I'll say on that is that religion wants to oppress all of our sexuality. So we, we, can, cer <laughs> we can certainly agree on that. Okay, now let, let's, let's back up a little bit and talk about mm -hmm. general things because uh, I'm curious where you, know, where you come at it uh, from, a, from a, a wider uh, look at this. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk about feminists in, in your writing, and um, I just want to make sure that we're, we're talking about the same things here because do you grant that, that feminists for a long time did great work in getting women rights that they clearly did not have and that today there might be a strand of radical feminism that you disagree with and I probably uh, I would be surprised if I didn't disagree with but that, there, that there's a distinction between uh, those two different branches of feminism. Um, in some ways yes, in other ways no. I mean if, if you look at um at even their advocacy right from the very beginning. Um, so this would be even before women suffrage and, and all of that. Um, and you look at uh, a cultural norm such as uh, sort of default father custody after divorce, um, which is the way things used to be done. And the reason why they were done that way is because the man had the sole financial responsibility for taking care of the children. And, uh, and if he was at fault for the marriage breakdown, he would continue to have financial responsibility for taking care of his ex-wife um, in the form of alimony, but he would still have the children because it was his job to take care of them. That was his entire, he was solely responsible for that. And uh, and you had activists like Carolyn Norton in the UK around the 1850s or so, um, complaining that this situation really didn't serve women's happiness. Um, and there was, it was mostly talk around uh, uh, what would make women happy and how it was unfair to women that they were made so unhappy after a divorce uh, because they lost their children. Um, so they convinced the British government uh, to change the laws and policies uh, into something called the Tender Years Doctrine. And what that did was it switched to everything to default mother custody. But at the same time, they kept the entire bill on the man. And now, even if a woman was at fault for the marriage breakdown, she would get custody of the kids and he would be responsible for paying her alimony. That's what child support was sort of lumped in together with it, um, because it was his responsibility still to support the household of his children. Right. So you you sort of had this transfer of rights without a transfer of responsibilities. And, and as far as I know, those responsibilities did not begin to swing the other way until equal rights legislation came around in the 1960s. Right. So you look at how they changed things. Right. I believe I do believe that there needed to be a renegotiation of gender roles and a renegoti renegotiation of the rights and responsibilities of men and women. But in so many cases, uh, what tended to happen was uh, feminists managed to get rights for women without the attendant responsibilities that went along with those things for men. And what feminists would call the default father custody that was that occurred before feminism, uh, they would call that male, male patriarchal privilege, right? Um, whereas nowadays, if you even suggest that you know men should not be forced to pay child support, even for kids that were born out of wedlock, that they had no say in whether they would be born, um, that's considered unfair. Right, that the woman who has the custody should have the entire responsibility. That's unfair to those women. Yet when it was men that got custody and responsibility, that was that was privilege. Right. So I mean, they they've really uh, renegotiated things in in such a way that that uh, women received a lot of rights and kept the responsibilities on the male half of the equation. And so, that's Karen, what I've always taken issue with. So, so Ken, I get that. And that's, that's a, certainly an interesting point historically and today, as we discussed in the beginning, custodial rights is some of the things that I think you guys have the best points on. But, there you go. Uh, but when we talk about uh, the history of feminism, uh, women weren't allowed to own property. They, uh, men got to make all the decisions in the household. They got to make all the business decisions. They weren't even allowed to vote. Uh, since you're a woman, Karen, I assume that you're happy that feminists got you the right to own property, the right to vote, etc. Again, with the property issue, that uh, that was a little bit one-sided too, because under coverture, uh, a woman who was single was considered fem sole, and she had every right to own property and earn income in her own name, and uh, and to enter into contracts under her own name. Um, 
this this was the way it was for a single woman. Uh, she could own a business, whatever, right? For a married woman, because the responsibility for her uh, financial well-being, all of the responsibility for the entire family was seated in the husband and father. Um, because of that, of course, he had authority within the family, right? Of course, he had the authority to, to decide how the money was spent. And another thing that feminists managed to do uh, between the 1850s and the 1910s uh, across most of the West was they emancipated women's property and income, not just from her husband, uh, but from the entire institution of family, right? So it was still his responsibility to pay for everything. Um, and her income was her own to do with as she wished. She was still entitled to his support, even if she made more money than him. And uh, that even went all the way down to the tax burden on her property and income. That was not her responsibility to pay. That was his responsibility to pay, right? Uh, and at that time, women won the right, even when married, to enter into contracts. So they could enter into contract with anybody, but most lenders were not stupid. Uh, they knew that they could not hold this woman accountable for her debt um, because it was her husband's job to pay for everything, right? And if she didn't have a husband, she, it could end up being falling on her father or her brother, right? Karen, so Karen, Karen. they would require a co-signer. This was seen to be you know, vastly unfair, but there was a reason for it, right? Karen. And the reason was it was the man who was ultimately accountable for repaying the debt. So I, I understand all that, and I think that you're generally making the case that the pendulum swung too far in, in giving uh, unequal uh, rights uh, to women at some point. But even before yeah. the cases that you're referring to, women, could, whether single or not, couldn't own any property. And now at, at this point... Uh, I, think, I think you'd have to really look into that. I yeah. think you really would. Because there, there were, uh, in for, the 1430s, there were female master blacksmiths on the roster in London. So, um, Karen, yes, it depends on the, the time period, the culture you're talking about, and how far back you go, right? There's no blanket answer, so it depends. In, in, of course in, there isn't, but, you, right. you know, people, but, but people overall, like to make blanket but statements Karen, like women couldn't own property. Well, that's just not the case. But, Karen, for Christ's sake, you have to concede that men certainly had throughout history far more ability to own property and to be the masters of their own fate in terms of finance than women. You've got to concede certainly. that, right? Certainly. Okay. Certainly that right. is certainly right. true. Okay, good. All right. So <laughs> now, isn't it, aren't we in a vastly better situation, even if it isn't nearly perfect uh, today than we were in those years? And it's because of the hard work of women who got those rights for other women? Well, like I said, uh, I would have been much happier if they'd done it in, uh, in a more equal way. Um, one of the things that, that has happened is that uh, we've become, we've come to consider certain things to be normal, um, like sort of the idea of, uh, of a man uh, being declared a default, you know, he's the default father declared in court because he didn't contest paternity in the first 30 days after the child was born. Um, there's a man who's facing jail in Michigan right now because he refuses to pay the $30,000 of back child support he supposedly owes for a child that isn't even his. Um, so, and we've sort of come to see uh, this, uh, this enforcement of responsibilities on men who sometimes had nothing to do with anything, like somebody who is not even the father of the kid, as is just the new normal, right? It's just it's just how it is, and this these are things that can really destroy somebody's life. Now, one of the things that I, I always try to draw attention to is is the fact that all of these things, all the way back to the beginning, you know, to the 1850s, um, have been reformed in ways where, it, in every sense, a woman. Uh, gains privileges and and a man loses them. So we we really have it 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 hasn't just the pendulum has swung, but it's it's just it's really 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 gone too far. And when you look at some of the complaints of modern day feminists, um, and this is really what it is like. I, if if it was just equal rights, if that's all it was about. Um, I would be, I would consider myself a feminist if that's all that there was. But there's all kinds of baggage attached to it. There's all kinds of theoretical uh, 
baggage and the feminist lens and a you know a system of philosophies and and uh, a worldview and ideology that's all attached to that and underpins what they do and those I feel the the theories are, are highly toxic I think that they they promote uh, discord they promote fear uh, between the sexes they promote resentment uh, and and they just they aren't good for anybody so so Karen look it, when it gets to specific issues uh, in the news etc we'll have to have bring you back on and have further uh, conversations uh, and but uh, just to round up this conversation, there's two other general points that I'd like to discuss. Look, mm. w when you talk about, you know, if you say radical feminism or radical uh, political correctness, there's another story out in the news today about how one of, one of the city universities in New York is going to take away Mr. and Miss uh, as titles because they think that it promotes gender inequality. How it does that, I have no idea, right? So, uh, so do I think that there is a, a place for a men's rights movement? Uh, to address how far the pendulum has swung and to address some of the issues where uh, men are being treated unequally, yes, I do. Uh, I, I'm just, I want to make sure that the pendulum for men's rights movement doesn't swing so far that it becomes radical in the opposite direction. So, like, that's why I'm, I'm going to ask one more time on the issue of the right to vote. I mean, we, you can't just tar feminism with the brush of current day, some small strand of radical feminism. I mean, feminists got women the right to vote. Shouldn't you give an enormous thank you to them? Not Actually, just because you're a woman, but also because for the sake of humanity, they did a great service to all of us? Okay, well, there were, there were two movements there, right? There was the suffragist movement, and then there was the suffragette movement. And the suffragist, suffragist movement was interested in votes for everybody. And uh, and they a lot of them really resented the suffragettes, particularly a lot of uh, female suffragists resented the suffragettes because the suffragettes got up to all kinds of crazy stuff. They they lobbed bombs, they burned post offices. They uh, I read a, an account in a, a man's diary from back then that uh, he they he they tried to push him off a cliff. Out of chivalry, he didn't report the attempted murder. You know, like so. I mean, like they got in into all kinds of uh, criminal activities and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. you could even say they were domestic terrorists. And a lot of the suffragists were like, you know, you're just demonstrating that women shouldn't have the vote. I mean, and a lot of public sentiment back then. And this is this is the history that we don't get told. Um, a lot of public sentiment back then was, well, if this is how women behave, like, should they get the vote? Um, and another thing, too, there were uh, politicians in the UK who were discussing um, giving the women the vote long before the suffragettes started up. And, uh, <clears throat> and oh, they, yeah, yeah. I'm sure, if, Karen, I'm they sure if they continue to ask politely, they would, they men would have given it to them anyway. Men were, have been such sweethearts throughout history. Okay. I'm sure they would have just said, hey, women, even though we've they denied took, you the right to vote for the entire history of mankind, literally mankind, a, if you poll. just stuck around and been polite, we'd have given it to you anyway. Come on, they, Karen, you got to realize that's took, the biggest load of horse crap you've ever heard in your life. They took a poll in England of women, and 70% of them didn't want the vote. They thought I know, they, and the women in Saudi thought, Arabia they, want the burqa. I they know, they it's thought, because of the culture that they grew up in. Karen, the give me a thank you. Look, I, I, we were everything's going they great, but you got, got, you're not being reasonable. Subject. You're being ridiculous. Job. Give me a thank you. Give me a thank you for feminists for getting your right to vote. Otherwise, oh, stop I'm, voting and go make me I, a ham sandwich. The expansion of the franchise is a lot more complicated than than what we've been led to believe. The women in that poll, the, the main reason that they cited was they did not want to be subject to the draft. And they thought that if they did, because this was the main justification for giving men the vote. And in most places, the amount of time between universal male suffrage and universal female suffrage was as little as 50 years, sometimes as little as 10, right? So it's never been a history of always men had the vote and made women wait for millennia. No, men got suffrage because men could be drafted. And SCOTUS even confirmed that in 1917 when there was a Supreme Court challenge uh, saying the draft was unconstitutional because it was involuntary servitude. And SCOTUS outright said that 
the draft is constitutional because it is a reciprocal object obligation on the part of citizens for the rights they receive from government, right? So you you have this this I, we have this idea that these decisions, right, that these differences between how men and women were treated, we have been told that all of this was just sexist and arbitrary and it was for no good reason. It was just because penis, right? But that 70% of women in that, in that poll, they were really concerned about the fact that they would have to take on all kinds of male responsibilities, that they would lose all kinds of privileges like the, you know, the exemption from the draft, their right to financial support. Karen, Karen, yada, yada, yada. Do you want the right to vote or not? Are you going to give a thank you to the women who fought so hard, sometimes risked their lives to get you that right to vote? Or are you going to just start keep saying, oh, well, the women of Saudi Arabia love wearing their burqas and the women in Britain who, while being oppressed and not having the right to vote, said, yeah, they like bending their neck and telling men that, hey, yes, we shouldn't vote. We're silly little women. Are you going to give me a thank you for that, or you're just going to keep on blah 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 on that? Ridiculous. And frankly, I think the last time I voted was uh, 14 years ago in a municipal election. Um, like Mother Jones uh, often said, you don't need the vote to kick ass. All right. That's okay. Then you're radical, Karen. You're absolutely ridiculously radical. I, so. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I thought we were having a rational conversation, and I was going to establish, like, okay, here are the things we agree on, here are the things that are obvious, but you won't grant the most obvious thing in the world. Okay, you don't vote, so you think not, voting is not that important. All right, give me that right back then, and let's go back to the world where men are in charge and women have no rights. My guess is, Karen, you're not going to like that world. You're not going to like it at all. I don't want to go back there. I mean, you're using using the voice that women fought so hard to give you now to fight back against women. There's a tremendous irony there. Okay, so women didn't have a voice, even though women were... Uh, they were key in the abolitionist movement. They managed to convince most of the country to prohibit alcohol before they had suffrage. Um, you know, women have always had a voice. Uh, women have been writing petitions to politicians, you know, since the they've been protesting for their rights since ancient Rome. Um, you know, these you cannot you can you have a very very different. Uh, view of what history was like and the power imbalance between men and women was like before women's suffrage, before the feminist movement. Um, you know, I have a different view of how things were back then, and I absolutely know that with or without the suffragettes, the franchise would have expanded. The franchise continued to expand, you know, all the way through, right? And most of the early expansion had to do with military service. The first 2,000 women to vote in Canada were military nurses, right? And they got the vote a year before the rest of the women in Canada. And not only that, they didn't have to wait till they were 21. All men and women in the military at that time could vote at the age of 18. Okay, right. Yeah, that sounds because cool. Because military service and the expansion of the franchise were intimately tied together at that time and then it expanded further and it included more and more and more people right Mm -hmm. and even now in canada we have a movement uh it's not a very popular uh or large movement yet but we have a movement to try and expand it to people over 16. so you know the the franchise has expanded and it would have expanded with or without the suffragettes because the suffragists were there agitating for votes for everyone I know the suffragettes were so bad. I mean, they didn't have any rights. How well, dare they, they didn't? didn't how dare they did, ask they for didn't. any rights, let alone equal rights? All right, we're no. out of time. Karen Strawn, uh, uh, we've is an interesting conversation. We probably will pick it back up, even though it's infuriating. Uh, <laughs> and her YouTube channel is Girl Writes What. Uh, her weekly show is called Honey Badger Radio. Uh, we have established, in my mind, at least in this initial conversation, that of course. There is room for men's rights movement in that there are legitimate concerns where men are being treated unequally at this point and that the pendulum has swung too far in one direction. On the other hand, it also appears to me that some portion of the men's rights movements is, as we suspected, radical and ridiculous. Uh, and, uh, Why, thank you. Yes, and, uh, and at least we have begun to establish those parameters. For that, we thank you, Karen.